are live. I would like to welcome everybody to yet another televisit for my SSI, Seminar and Scholarly Inquiry 165 class here at the University of Puget Sound. It's a freshman writing seminar. And as a fulcrum for that course, I like to use parasitism and symbioses in and around us to maintain student interests and allow them to come up with very interesting ideas as they have with their term papers of which I just looked at a draft. So what I'd like to do now is point out that I've been fortunate in having some very well-known scientists offer to televisit my classroom. We've had a total of, we're going to have a total of six. Today is number five. And what's happened is that those individuals have sent readings to my students. My students have read those and came up with questions to share with the scientist who then is kind enough to share some time with us today. Today, I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Susan Perkins, who's curator, I love that title, and <laughs> professor of microbial genomics at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. So this is a bi-coastal session today, folks. And I'd like everyone to, to welcome Dr. Perkins, and I will turn the camera around so you can see the classroom. Welcome. Hey. Well, let's get you up on the screen. There you go. And here is my class. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys? Good. Good, good. It's a beautiful day here in New York City. They're already setting up the stage for the Thanksgiving Day Parade out in front of the museum. So that will be next week. Um, can you guys hear me OK? OK, cool. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about my job here, a little bit about what it's like being a curator and a curator of microbiology. And I know a couple of you asked me specific questions with that, so maybe that will answer some of those. Um, so I am one of two curators of microbiology here at the American Museum of Natural History. And I've been here at the museum for about 11 years. Um, at which point, uh, it stemmed out of a, a request by my colleague, Rob DeSau, who had moved from being more of a Drosophila systematist, population geneticist, and working more with whole genomes, but at that point, um, bacteria. And he wanted my colleagues to do microbiology, and so they put out a call, and I was lucky to get the first position. So. I'm one of the two curators, and then Unsu Kim, who studies some really cool symbiosis, looking at how um, phototrophy may have evolved. So, studies protists that eat bacteria but can still photosynthesize. And she also studies a really cool salamander symbiosis where green algae live inside the salamander egg sacs and then eventually become symbiotic within the salamanders themselves. So. Maybe someday she can come talk to you guys because she does really cool symbiosis stuff too. Um, so I actually, I did a televisit to another class yesterday in Maryland and one of those students also asked what special skills you need to be a curator. And my answer is kind of nothing. <laughs> um, I don't feel like I had special skills in that sense. So my job is essentially doing research and, and functioning much like a professor would. So um, I'm you know, reading, writing grants, uh, writing papers, and then we have a graduate program here at the museum. So we grant PhDs in comparative biology. So we have about 16 to 20 students at a time working on their PhDs. And so I teach grad classes uh, to those students, both our core classes in systematics and evolution, and then electives. Um, so you know, I do those things. And then every once in a while, an exhibit comes along where one of us is going to be appropriate. So all of our temporary exhibits have a curator associated with them. Uh, one of our, we have 42 curators here. And so this microbiome exhibit was, um, was being being about three or so, and so Rob Desal, the, the guy I mentioned before, the colleague, we uh, decided you know, we had to be the ones to curate this. And so um, I don't know if you guys saw the Mark. Did they see the video tour? 
Well, I didn't share that with them because okay. I didn't. I wanted to make sure it didn't get out further because okay. you asked me not to let that happen. Well, By the way, I'm I'm very bitter because I really want to go to this exhibit. <laughs> there there are two reasons. Number one, Dr. Perkins is there, who just wrote a wonderful book on the microbiome, and number two, they have an enormous freaking tardigrade hanging in midair. We have a lot you know, of enormous I, freaking tardigrades. Yeah. So, and you know, the, the bad part is if I were to go, I could not leave the tardigrade. <laughs> you could just grab it and we'd have to drag you off. Like, so Braith knows all about that. Braith has a <laughs> tardigrade too, right? There you go. Cool. So anyway, it's quite a wonderful exhibit. And, and Dr. Perkins had sent me kind of a video walkthrough, but mm -hmm. didn't want to, because the museum puts it on, I, I didn't want that getting out. Well, so. I don't mind if you share that video um, you know, in class or whatnot. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, so it's a it's a big temporary exhibit. Um, it uh, covers a lot of aspects of the microbiome, and we're really hoping that what it's going to do is allow the public. And when I say that, it's literally everything from from school groups that come here to at the moment, we're shocking. We have about fifty percent of our visitors are in our app. so we have a lot of visitors that are coming in to see our exhibit. And um, so we want to give them the, that experience to learn what the microbiome is, uh, how their daily lives are affecting it, things like the food they eat and medicines that you would take, things like that. Um, and then we tried to make it really fun, too. So that's really cool. So um, I just start with some of the questions? Is that... That sure, if, if that's what you'd like to do. I, I really am happy that you, you gave kind of an overview of what it is like to be a curator. Uh, I did point them towards your website and blog where you actually have a blog post about that. Yeah. But every, everyone does lots of different things. Laurel, am I right? Lauren, everyone's pretty busy? <laughs> so please, I think the questions be nice. Okay. Uh, and folks, when, when Dr. Perkins calls your name, you want to wave big so she can see you. Well, how about it? I'll go through and at least do one of, from each of you guys. Does that sound good? If, if, that's, if that's your time and inclination. All right, let's see how this goes. I'll try not to ramble. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question on my sheet is from, or the first letter from Mary. Hi, Mary. Um, so you asked me a couple. What's the easiest one I can answer here? Oh, you know which one I like? I like your second question here about, so Mary asked about the common ancestor of plasmodium. Um, and that's, that's a really neat question because I think our understanding of the evolution of malaria and the group that it's in is changing a lot. So, um, so when I first started, there was only one molecular study out there and it was kind of uh, revolutionary, if you will, because the first sequencing that was done on malarial parasites put Plasmodium falciparum, right, the species that causes the most deaths in people, as closely related to malaria in birds, specifically chickens. And they, um, the authors of the paper reasoned that when we domesticated chickens, that the parasite jumped from chickens into people, and that the reason why Plasmodium falciparum is so virulent is because it was a relatively new parasite of ours. So the estimates are we domesticated chickens about 4,000 years ago or so. Um, and so that became wildly popular because I think people love this idea that, that diseases are deadly when they jump into a new species, right? And you've probably read a few examples of that already in this class that you're doing. Um, but uh, it turned out that if you actually looked at their analyses, they had it backwards. And so um, if you construct an evolutionary tree, you can code certain characters on it. And so if you, if you looked at the hosts of all of those parasites and then optimized what the common ancestor should have been, it actually, the results were backwards. And it said that we would have given malaria to chickens when we domesticated them. So it was a wrong interpretation of their results. And then it's kind of been this flurry of increasing data and figuring out where that common ancestor came from. And so we're just running some new analyses. We've got the largest data set across the whole family that malaria belongs to. 
And um, it's looking very solidly like, yes, the ancestors uh, of that whole family were probably using birds. But when I say birds, we're talking about 100 million years ago. And of course, there were some very big birds out there in the form of dinosaurs. So um, we don't know that dinosaurs had malaria, but it's very possible that they could have. Um, and then as, as you get into what's really plasmodium, it looks like the very first mammal host might have been bats. And that's pretty cool to me. Uh, you know, you hear a lot about bats being uh, reservoirs and hosts for other things, you know, Ebola and SARS and um, some of the other viral diseases, and in addition to things like rabies. And so um, bats are, are really cool in that sense. Um, they have kind of super immune systems. And so discovering more parasites in bats has been really cool. Um, so we're following up on that, but the, stay tuned. <laughs> but we think, we think originally the group was in birds, but probably in mammals first got into bats. Cool. All right. I, uh, next one is Theo. Hey, Theo. Um, let's see. By the way, Teo really likes the idea oh, of, fossil, of the fossil record in parasites. That's his term paper Ooh. topic. He's really into it. I know. I wish we had a better fossil record. Um, you know, we don't have any fossils for malaria, really. Um, I'm sort of answering a question you didn't ask me, but since you're interested in that, uh, the one fossil-ish we have is an, a biting midge from um, amber that we know is about 100, 120 million years old. And you can see the oocyst stages on that midge's gut. So as the malaria parasite goes through its life cycle, it gets picked up by the vector and then it makes a cyst on the exterior of the, of the mid gut, so like that. Um, and so we can see that there's an oocyst, but you can't tell even what what genus it was, right? So the, all the members of that entire family, but that sort of goes to the um, to the recent analysis we've been doing. Um, let me see. I'm going to deal with your last question, I think, which is about parasite infections not detected by PCR. And actually, I think a couple of you asked somewhat similar questions about molecular methods and detecting infections. And one of the challenges, of course, is that um, you know, and hopefully you, you took this out of the paper I sent around, is that if we're talking about parasites, we usually have a complete misbalance, right? We have parasites that are important for either medicine or veterinary, and in most of those cases, we have complete genomes for those parasites by now. But then their relatives, which might infect wildlife, we have very little genetic information. And malaria is just one example of this dichotomy, right? We have genomes from the human parasites and the ones that infect rodents as their models um, that we raise in the lab. But for the other ones, we haven't had many markers. And so when we design diagnostic PCRs to test them, we're relying on conserved regions in the gene. But if you're talking about a very diverse group, there's really no guarantee that those PCR primers are going to pick up all those species. And so it's very possible that we can miss infections because the primers just don't bind to the parasite DNA. However, it's also possible that we're just not hitting it at a right point in the life cycle either. So you have to, if we're talking about a blood parasite, for example, you need to have the stages circulating in the blood before you would pick it up. But um, so, you know, we do our best to, to uh, design the best primers and to screen things carefully, but um, it's very possible we can be missing things. So, cool. All right, next is Braith. Is that right? Hey. <laughs> I was like, I don't know why I was doing this. I don't know how that was going to help me look around <laughs> the screen, but yeah. <laughs> um. Let me see. Uh, oh, yeah, this is really cool. So you asked me, would it be possible slash practical to find a way to study parasites while they're still inside the host? Yeah, that would be, I mean, that's such a really cool idea. Um, you know, we don't have much ability to 
to do live visualizations of especially small microparasites. Um, I went to a meeting about a month and a half ago at the White House that was organized about the microbiome. And this was one of the top priority things that came out of the scientists that were there, uh, which was doing developing technology that we could do live observation of microbes, and, and I include parasites with this, right? So we can study things under a microscope and see vaguely how they look, but we just we have a hard time visualizing things in vivo. So yeah, that would be awesome. I know that's not a great answer, just to say we would like that. Um, and you also were asking about taking host attributes into account. Yeah, we definitely sometimes do that in the sense of trying to take metadata for parasites. I mean, yeah, for the parasite. So what's the host? Where was it caught? What's the sex of the host? What's the age of the host? Um, things like that. So the if you looked in, say, GenBank or other databases, it's very spotty. Um, so I wish that there were better data for most attributes. Yeah. yeah. Um, next is Katie. If you can turn it around there. Hi, Katie. I didn't even know you were going there. there. Um, so you had asked about a curator. That right? You asked about a cur being a curator, right? And then you also asked about this, um, the mycozoa, right? Dream body degeneration. So you, did you guys just read that study this week or last week? Was that? Yes, yeah. The yeah. yeah. So my colleague here, Mark Siddall, um, worked on that system when he was, I think, a postdoc. So he was one of the first people to just sequence uh, ribosomal RNA genes out of mycozoa and and was the first person to have that molecular hypothesis that mixozoans were actually cnidarians, so kind of miniaturized jellyfish, if you will. And then, yeah, Pauline Cartwright and her group at Kansas did this full genome study, which was very cool. Um, yeah, and it's a very neat system about why, um, why an organism would go, as you guys put, a couple of you said, backwards, right? So smaller number of cells, much simplified body plan. And I mean, I think the overall answer, even though it's pretty simplistic, is just if selection favors that, then that's what will happen. And I think probably in the case of mixozoa, you had, you know, we don't know for certain, but you could have tiny parasitic or, yeah, cnidarians that eventually just became intracellular and smaller celled things with this much simpler body plan. Um, just were more successful. And so selection favored that pathway. And, you know, organisms don't get to choose and determine, you know, which way down the evolutionary tree of life they're gonna go. It's just the expression of their phenotype and then selection acts on that and you'll result. Even in the case of something like this, where we might think of it as kind of like an evolutionary dead end, because it's gonna be very, very hard to go back the other way now that they've lost a lot of these genes um, and cell plan basically. So and you also, you know, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to interrupt that because I'm thinking about where you are, and I read a lot of bad fiction. And come to think of it, Relic, <laughs> Relic yeah. was set at the American Museum of Natural History, which is yeah. about a very, very nasty, changing genetic monster. But it's not really like that, is it? Well, I I have to be completely honest. So the cafeteria, the mail room. Uh, and our IT department are all in the basement here. And I think about that movie every single time I go down there. <laughs> <laughs> I read the book too, and then the movie just scarred me for life. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I hope this thing is not down there. <laughs> um, is it? Right. I know. It keeps the public out because they try to come down and to the lower level. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Didn't you see the movie Relic? Don't come down here. Um, Katie also asked about uh, why mixozoans still have stingers or the nematocysts. And I, I mean, that's a good question. I don't know that we know. I know that I don't know. <laughs> um, but there must be some, there, it must be doing something for them. Maybe it's helping them in some way invade the host cells uh, or trigger. I know a lot of the mixes, though, a trigger a, 
a matrix around their cells, right? So they're mm -hmm. inside the host and it's almost like a cyst. So maybe there's some role there, but I mean, good question. I just, I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> um, next is Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Um, let's see. I think I want to answer the last one here. So you asked me a couple of good ones, but some of them we touched on. But that is how I started studying microbiome. Uh, and there's sort of an honest answer and then I guess uh, sort of a real, <laughs> I was going to say an honest and a real answer. So one of the honest answers is that I think everyone now studying microbiology says they study the microbiome, right? <laughs> And that's one thing we're learning. There's a lot of, there's a big trend in funding microbiome and talking about it. So, you know, if you used to do soil ecology and do microbes, you now do soil microbiomes, right? And if you did any other kind of, you know, animal microbiology, you do the microbiome. Um, but uh, what I will say is there's a cool intersection now between the malaria work that I've been doing and microbiome. So both of my PhD students, plan to do some microbiome work as the, part of their dissertation. So um, about a year ago or so, a paper came out that was really cool, and, and um, it didn't get a lot of press, but it really hit me hard. And that was a study that showed that, so uh, I have to back up one second. So as an infant, you have a very different microbiome than when you're an adult. Right? And so your gut microbiome is sort of setting up shop. And one of the things we know is happening is that it's training your immune system, right? And so we want, we want microbes in our gut. We want the right ones in there. They're doing their happy thing. We don't want microbes in our blood. Generally, bacteria in our blood is not a good thing. And so E. coli and probably other gut microbes are um, triggering the production of antibodies are essentially, um, they're actually um, not protein, but they're carbohydrate defense molecules. And they will bind to bacteria if they find them in the blood. And it turns out that they will also bind to malaria sporozoids, the transmission species. And so this was very important because it shows that a good gut microbiome can give you protection against malaria later in life. Um, and the authors tested this with mice, so they used germ-free, um, totally uh, microbiome-free mice, and then infected them with the rodent malaria. And so, you know, normally that mosquito is injecting thousands of sporozoites in. They don't all make it to the liver, and they don't all establish because our immune system is, is functioning. But in the germ-free mice that didn't have a microbiome, almost all of them made it to the liver, and they had a massive infection. Whereas a normal mouse with a normal gut microbiome, you know, it might get infected, but it was much less severe. And so they, uh, the authors were suggesting that maybe that's part of the reason why the majority of malaria deaths are in children. So we, I mean, we know that there's an immune response there, but we didn't realize that the gut microbiome may be a key player in that malaria immune response. Anyway, that's all the backstory. And so my student, Spencer, who works on avian malaria, now wants to look at the role of the avian immune system and the gut microbiome as well in terms of how it's responding to malarial infections. And then my new student, Kelly, who is interested in bat malaria and bat parasites, wants to focus on the microbiome of the vectors that are on bats. Um, and a lot of bats have these persistent ectoparasites that live on them, um, and they're the vectors of some of their malarial parasites. So she wants to look at at how microbiome composition in the vector might alter their ability to transmit both the malaria parasite, but also maybe some viral pathogens, which we know are important in bats. So, so I've you know I got interested in the microbiome and doing the exhibit, but now I'm watching my two worlds sort of collide here and and thinking about it more in terms of malaria as well. So, cool. All right, next is Gloria. Hey. <laughs> Um, so let's see, um, well, since we were talking about malaria and I've kind of answered a little bit about my field of study, though I can tell you more in a second. Uh, so you asked me about the differences between malaria and humans and animals and other things. So 
if we're talking about the family, Hemosporida, which is what malaria is in, we've got about 500 described species and about 15 or so genera. And they're very similar. They all have a similar life cycle, but they have key differences. Um, sometimes in the vector that they use, and it turns out that that pattern is very strong. So when we see major cladogenic events in the malaria tree of life, uh, they almost always correspond to a swap. So we think of malaria being transmitted by mosquitoes, and that's true for the plasmodium species that infect mammals. But for other genera in that family, they use things like black flies and midges, and even things like deer and horse flies. So the vector can be a, a big difference. And also one of the key things is whether or not the parasites, where they spend their first rounds of replication. So again, we think about from human malaria, they go to our liver and replicate, but they don't do that in all of these systems. And then some of them don't even do their asexual reproduction in the blood cells. So what causes fevers in human malaria would be those rounds of reproduction, and then they burst out of the blood cell, and then we get a spike in fever, and then they go back into another blood cell and things quiet down. So it's those rounds of, of replication. But there are parasites in this group that don't even use red blood cells for that replication at all. They only put the transmission stages or the gametocytes in the blood. So there's actually, it's a really ton of variation that's out there, and that's, I think, partly what makes it an interesting group to study, because looking at, I'm interested in the genomic basis of what causes those changes, so. Yeah, cool question. Um, Talia, is that right? Did I say that right? Yes. Cool. <laughs> Was that close enough? No, it was perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, oh, yeah, so you asked about signals in the host that are communicating with the parasite into specialized forms and what mechanisms allow a parasite to change their physiology. Um, so if I can drone on for just a little bit more about malaria, because I can tell you about uh, some new work that we're starting that I think bears on to that. Um, which is, I was mentioning that some parasites go into red blood cells and do the replication. So we're working now on a group of sister species that infect lizards in the Caribbean. And so they're most closely related, but one of them infects red blood cells and one of them infects white blood cells. And so I did a paper back when I was a grad student and showed that they were separate species, so they do not appear to be exchanging genes. They're distinct lineages. And so we just got data back. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet because it's 271,000 sequences. No, 271 million sequences, so it's intimidating. Uh, but we're looking at how the host responds differently when it's got infections in a red blood cell or a white blood cell. And also because they're close to related, I'm really interested in seeing what genomic changes there are between those two species. So, you know, I observe these lizards and I can see they have parasites in one blood cell or the other blood cell. They almost never have both at the same time, though very occasionally it does happen. Um, but I remember as a, when I was a graduate student working, um, one of my committee members studied invasion by host, um, invasion of host cells by malaria. And they just, they can't get over the fact that you could have a parasite that could go infect white blood cells because we think of them, you know, from a human point of view and our red blood cells and white blood cells are so drastically different, right? Our, our red cells are basic tiny little discs of hemoglobin and not very much else in there. But in lizards and birds, they have nuclei and they have organelles and they're much more complicated. But I'm really interested to see um, what those changes are, but also looking at it as, as you were mentioning from the point of view of the host. Because um, I think, you know, there's some really interesting co-evolutionary dynamics that go on, right? So, you know, uh, if you think about the things that make us ill, so when you get a virus or a bacterial infection and you feel you have certain symptoms, right, a lot of that could be, say, toxins that that microorganisms producing, but a lot of our symptoms are our own immune system making us feel sick, right? It's 
you know, you're sneezing because you're making lots of mucus and it's your body's way of, of getting rid of those pathogens. So, so these infections are two way um, conversations, if you will. Does that make sense? Okay. Cotton. That's you, Cotton. I said that like my friend Michelle said. She always says button and cotton. <laughs> um, so you asked uh, about high rates of error in parasitology. Do you mean in like taxonomy and stuff, like how the, par the paper was talking about? He says yes, but he okay. tells me he has a sore throat. Gotcha. Well, see, you got your immune system is uh, <laughs> is interacting with something there. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that I was hoping to convey in the paper was, um, you know, oftentimes when we're studying parasitology, we don't have a whole lot of information to work with, especially if we're talking about morphology. And so parasites, you know, just like the Mixozoan example in that recent paper you guys read, often are degenerate or have very simplified body plans. So whatever helps them kind of swoop in under the radar, get into their cells, um, if they're intracellular or what. And so it can be very hard to come up with what we um, systematists would call synapomorphies or a shared character that everything, say, in that species would have or higher classification. And so, um, so that's been a big problem. You just don't have enough morphological information to identify things. And another big problem um, is that you can have convergence, right? So if you're a parasite, you have a certain set of characters often that you need in order to be successful at invading a host. And so lots of parasites, even though they might be originally from unrelated lineages, will converge um, on a similar morphology as well. So those are some of the reasons we can make a lot of mistakes. And then on the genetic side, I think it started to clear things up, but it hasn't always been an easy route. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why, ranging from um, high diversity that can be out there, which I talked about before, where um, where you just, it's difficult to get the right molecular markers that you need to really get the level of variation uh, correct so you can make a, a phylogenetic tree um, to uh, the fact that their genomes are changing sometimes very rapidly and so um, we can lose the signal. So yeah, there's there's tons of reasons. I always like to say to my colleagues who study, you know, dinosaurs or, or other, you know, megafauna, like you guys have it easy. You know, you have so many, so many ways. Like, if you want to identify a species of frog, there's lots and lots of ways to do that. So cool. All right. Let me do it. I'm looking at your clock too. You guys have only about 10 more minutes ish, right? Looks like about 15. Okay. Okay. We should be good then. All right. Carmen. So several of the students, uh, I have one that's sick and I yeah. have three that have gone to a swim meet and Carmen is one of those people. All so right, I'm going to skip for now, just in the interest okay. of time so we can get all the people that are, are there. Christopher. Sure, but you need to be, would you like, I, I, we have a question, Elena, speak up if you'd like oh, to. Yeah. I think it's sort of a quick question, like based on what the things you've said so far. Um, so you were saying that like in the like human version of the malaria parasite, it replicates in our liver, that right? So what is like special about those cells versus like other organs in our bodies? And like, has there been like a certain aspect of like co-evolution between like humans and malaria to like, evolved that way or was it sort of like by like chance that like it discovered that this is like oh man like this is a good place for us to like set up shop like how was how is that to happen yeah i don't i don't know um i'm trying to think across the whole family and i would say off the top of my head no because i think some of the very basal groups thinking about a, a parasite of birds, one of the genera is leukocytosol, and it, it also does its first rounds of replication in the, in the liver. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question, but I think it'd be tough to, to unless we have a time machine, to sort of wind back and figure out what was so special about that. But maybe maybe as we start to do this as a, as a much more comparative approach, we'll get it from 
those answers. So one of the other bits of data we just got back was um, from a different bat malarial parasite. So not a plasmodium, but a parasite called hepatocystis. And as its name, hepatocystis, it makes these huge liver stages. Um, so normal parasites will just start there and they'll do the first massive round of replication. These guys do so much replication that you can visibly see the cyst in the liver of the bat. So it's, I mean, it's not huge, but you're talking about millions and millions that happen there. So that's one of the reasons why we're interested in looking at its genome is what the heck's going on there? Why is it so like berserk in the liver? Yeah. Replicate in like other organs and like the human body? Like, is it like not so much as yeah, we're our system, our malaria is kind of boring in that way because it just comes in, gets in the liver, does a replication, and then goes immediately and does everything else in our red blood cells. Whereas in some of the bird parasites, they use spleen, they use um, endothelial tissue in places like the lung. Yeah, they're much more flexible in terms of, of what's happening. And I think, you know, now if, if I'm if I'm right with the latest trees that were making the malaria and human malaria um, kind of came up here and we have this united group of mammals, it probably was once you started doing that, kind of like the mixozoa again, you're just stuck, right? You, you evolved this ability to infect just liver cells and red blood cells and that's it. That was good. All right. So, uh, Christopher is ill. Okay, sorry, Christopher. Hope you feel better. Um, JT, hi, JT. Um, I'm just reading these. You have a whole bunch that are cool. Um, and I think I talked a little bit about some of that. In other words, I don't want to be too redundant. Um, oh, you know what? Your question made me think of something that I wanted to throw back to you guys a little bit. So, yeah, you were talking about mixozoa and how microscopic parasites change the way we define the word animal, which I think is a, is a neat question, right? So if we would call a jellyfish an animal, which I think most biologists, zoologists would, then if you're talking about a tiny parasitic very simple cell thing is that still an animal so you guys asked me that but now i want to ask you though so what do you think what do you think our definition of animal should be that's really sort of the minimum the minimum requirement to be an animal do we have like a current working definition of <laughs> As I'm asking you, what's your current working definition of it? Is there one just like generally right now? Like, are we like adapting a current as definition? Not that I know of, no. Yeah. Like, the scientific community doesn't have like a definition for what it is? Not really. An animal is a macroscopic multicellular Okay. Macroscopic multicellular organism. Okay. So, do you, do you call a sponge an animal? Yeah, see, there you go. Now, this is very interesting for a different reason, Dr. Perkins, is Elena over here, her term paper is on a very unusual topic, and I'll let her tell you what that is. Um, my term paper is on the Tasmanian devil face cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <laughs> what do I want you to say? So this idea of, of reductive, of kind of a reductive evolution, so do, do you call those cancer cells Tasmanian devil cells anymore? You know no. what I mean? Yeah, so they like come from like one original host that I think there's a lot of theories about why it's been able to be so successful and sort of just like get into the entire population. There's theories about like low genetic diversity due to like a bottleneck effect in the actual like Tasmanian devils, but it's like all these mutated like cells that are drastically different from the host cell, like the healthy like somatic cells of the Tasmanian devils, and it's really crazy that like their immune systems don't kind of go after the like these foreign cells that should be like huge markers of like yeah. this is my body, but they are attacking it for some reason. Yeah, that's a, it's such a cool system. I mean, it's tragic. It's it's horrible that these poor wow. Tasmanian devils are getting so disfigured and dying. But you know, an infectious cancer—that's so. 
So this isn't taught anymore, Dr. Perkins, but surely you remember the whole business with amphioxus. Yeah, because yeah. There's a larval stage that has a, something like a backbone, but it's lost by the time that they come. So what do you call it? Is it a vertebrate or not, right? Right. And very similar to the question Dr. Perkins is putting. How are you defining an animal? If you have this reductive form of, I hate to use the term reductive evolution directly like this, mm -hmm. but here you have what is essentially a jellyfish, and now it's this tiny bundle of cells that are from the same derivative. Brand so you I want to ask you guys too, because I know you've been doing symbioses, and I, I go back and forth with my colleague Rob and the co-curators, is, is a virus a microbe? <laughs> is a virus a microbe? My microbiology students really enjoy this question. What do you folks think? Is a virus a microbe? So Cotton says thumbs down because are you fighting a virus? Is that why? <laughs> Braith, what do you think? So this is something I talk about with my microbiology students a lot. Um, you look at very, very small pieces of RNA called viroids that you, are, you want to call that alive? That's very difficult to, to say. And now there are these enormous viruses right. under the general category of Mimi viruses, mega viruses, Pandora viruses. I don't know what they're going to call them next, except the general term now is gyrus. <laughs> Giant virus? Yes, exactly right. Virus. And, and they're finding all kinds of genes that you don't normally find in viruses. So again, I think, and I don't mean to speak for you, Braith, but that you and I have talked about this before. So much of, of nomenclature is binary in nature. And that's kind of a joke when I say binary in nature yeah. because it's actually more of a, it's more of a continuum. <laughs> so I don't know if that, if that helps, but it seems a lot of students are sympathetic to that. Yeah. I mean, we, Rob likes to say, oh, we can't call them microbes because they can't replicate on their own. You know, if right. we put them in a, t and I, but I said, well, you know, mycobacterium tuberculosis can't replicate on its own either. But, yeah. you know, and, we and, call that alive. And to play the inside baseball game with that, you ask about innate metabolic activity outside the host. Because right. mycobacterium does cleave ATP outside the host. Yeah. Um, even spores have very, very low metabolic activity. But what I say to people nowadays, because I'm, I'm kind of a jerk, <laughs> is I say, wait until next week, because we're always finding new things. And one of the things that I've, I've taught all of my students is to be aware of what I call centricities. Because we look at most problems through uh, a lens of eukaryocentrism, of oxycentrism, and even microbiologists tend to be coli-centric. They think everything's like E. coli. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm really delighted that many of my students are more open-minded. Definitely, definitely. Um, I was just going through, I know there's a few more questions, but um, if I haven't hit one of yours, but you have another question you wanna ask before time runs out, does anybody wanna jump in? You want to? Anybody? Would you like to? Okay. Anybody who would like to have a question answered? Because we have about five minutes left. Well, go ahead. If you want. No one's saying anything. Well, I just was like, cause, okay, so I read um, the, you sent out a few links for us, and um, I was looking at the link to the one page for that kind of talked about the, um, what do you call it, the uh, exhibit at the museum and um, the part on your gut microbes. And I'm really interested in gut microbes and kind of how eating affects them. And I was just kind of wondering, um, it was such a small little blurb on there about like um, 
how ancient gut microbes are well, are much more diverse than the current ones. And I was just kind of wondering about your opinion on whether or not that's a good thing. Yeah, right. I remember your question, right? Was this Lauren? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting um, question and, and something that I think we're, we're starting to think about, right? So one of the things we show in the exhibit, we designed it so there's sort of three-sided cubes, if you will. And so you can flip them and they each compose a different picture. And uh, one of them is of, it's supposed to be a, a dude, but I think like an Italian guy with a big pizza. And then there's hunter-gatherer traditional Hadza society from Tanzania. Then some Amerindian population from uh, Brazil, I believe, right? And then there's Jim Leach. <laughs> is that uh, is that those two traditional societies have much higher gut microbe biodiversity than we do? Um, but one of the things is uh, I don't know if you guys have read it, but Howard Ackman and his group had a paper come out last year um, where they compared the gut microbiome of great apes as well. So. Uh, bonobos, chimps, and gorillas, and their gut microbiomes are even way more diverse than ours. So about five times more biodiversity in their gut microbes, um, microbiomes than in humans. Um, and that's like the best of humans, even with those. So, you know, it's one of the, one of the things we try to say is that we've had this, you know, you always hear about the sixth extinction, but probably the fifth and a half extinction <laughs> happened more recently in industrial times in our guts, right? So we've lost a number of taxa that, you know, not everybody has the same gut microbiome, but if you sampled, say, all of you sitting there now, you would have seen these taxa show up at some point. Um, but now because of antibiotic use and our crappy diets and things like that, we've just lost some of that key diversity. And the truth is we just don't know what it could have, what it could be doing for us yet. And so, so yeah, should we should we try to say cultivate some of that those other taxa, some of the um, lineages that you might see in traditional peoples, and then take them as probiotics or fecal transplants or or something like that? I mean, I think I think there will be. I'd be super 